Welcome to a special episode of Marcelina, the refit of my Reliance 44 sailboat. In the previous episode, I explained how I struggled in vain to get the 40 horsepower Volvo Penta diesel engine started, and before I sank more time and money into it, I decided to dispense with it entirely, and then I donated it to a local mechanic. So in this video, I'll discuss my alternative to the diesel engine in the process of going electric. I'll first cover why I decided to go this route, then I'll describe some of how I'm making it happen. First, the primary reason why I'm going electric is environmental, but it also simplifies many aspects of the operating and maintaining of an auxiliary propulsion system, as well as makes it much more convenient. And finally, there are some clear performance advantages. So, as I said, the primary driver is to be better to the environment. Oil, diesel, antifreeze, all inevitably get spilled or leaked to some degree into the environment. And the fuel that ends up doing what it's supposed to do and gets burned in the engine, and that ends up contributing to the larger issue of climate change. An article a few years ago by David Roberts at Vox captures quite well what I think is a sound strategy and one that I've embraced. Electrification of everything from transportation to our buildings helps reduce CO2 emissions because 37% of the power on our current grid already comes from zero carbon sources, and that number is only growing. So I did the math and found that even running at optimal speed and power, my Volvo Penta engine would produce about 23 pounds of CO2 per hour, while an equivalent electric motor running at the same output and getting its electricity from the same average mix of sources that I just showed would equal the equivalent of about 16 pounds of CO2 per hour. And as I'll talk about in a bit, when I'm charging my batteries off-grid with wind and solar, I will have a zero CO2 contribution. The second reason I'm going electric is to make things simpler. The easiest way to explain this is that in an electric motor, there's just one moving part, the rotor, which directly turns the shaft, while an internal combustion engine has dozens, even hundreds of moving parts. And that's even before you get to the transmission. Add to that a cooling system, a fuel system, an electrical system, and the mechanical control linkages, and you have lots of things that can go wrong. Lots of things that need maintenance and that require spare parts if you go on an extended journey. Don't forget about things like oil changes and even winterizing your boat if you live in a cold climate like here in New York. Reason number three is convenience. Not the kind of convenience that comes from the simplicity of an electric motor that I just outlined, although that certainly is more convenient, but rather the type of convenience I wouldn't have thought of until I owned my own electric car. When I pull into the garage with my car, I plug in as a matter of routine. Then I effectively have a full tank every time I leave home. No more looking for gas stations and jockeying for position at the pump. The same is true for my boat, or any boat for that matter. When you pull into your slip at the marina, you plug in to shore power to keep your house bank topped up. I'll do that too, but I'll also be charging up my separate drive batteries. No more wasting time or money at the fuel dock. And, like I said earlier, once I've added wind and solar, which I'll do next year, I won't even need to plug into shore power, and I'll be continuously filling my tank wherever I go. Lastly, there are some definite performance advantages to electric over internal combustion engines. The first is that the full motor output, seen as torque delivered to the drive shaft, is available immediately without the ramp up and RPM that's required of a typical internal combustion engine. This can be important when maneuvering or needing to get out of the way of another boat in a hurry. Second is the heat produced by the gas or diesel engine, which can make the cabin of your boat very uncomfortable. This demonstration performed by the electric motor manufacturer Elko shows a huge difference in heat output. This is because an internal combustion engine only converts about 25% of the fuel energy into motion while releasing the other 75% of the energy as waste heat. 
An electric motor, on the other hand, is typically about 90% efficient, producing very little heat. The other comfort factor is noise. Again, in an ELCO demonstration, they showed a typical diesel engine at about 85 decibels, while the electric motor is just 68 decibels. It may not seem like a big difference, but it's the equivalent of having a conversation with a friend on a quiet sidewalk and then trying to continue that conversation as a big garbage truck rumbles by. From both the heat and the noise perspective, the quality of life inside the boat improves dramatically. But I don't want to give the impression that going electric doesn't have some issues. The pros, as I've noted, are pretty significant, but there are some cons. One con is the initial cost. I say initial cost because the purchase price is fairly high, but much of that cost is mitigated the longer you own the boat and the more you use it. The other issue is range. I can't just motor at close to hull speed for a hundred straight hours the way I could with the old setup. But on the other hand, once I have the wind and solar charging, I can sail and motor from anchorage to anchorage and always have a full tank within a day or two of sitting at anchor. Or because range is highly dependent on speed, I could, given enough charging capacity, essentially motor indefinitely, albeit fairly slowly. So while having full diesel tanks does give you the most range in a limited period of time, that range advantage isn't so clear-cut. Now that I've covered the reasons why I'm going electric, let's talk about the specifics of how I'm doing it. When I first started contemplating this move a few years ago, I started talking to a company called Electric Yacht. However, when it came to actually picking the motor, I realized that the electric yacht system was about two inches too tall for the space I had in my boat. So looking around, I found Elko. They had a 29.4 kilowatt system, which exactly matched the 40 horsepower output of the original Volvo Penta engine, and it fit in the space available with room to spare. I also researched products by Oceanvolt and Torquedo. These are both European manufacturers compared to Elko, whose shop is near Albany, New York. I don't have any problem with European manufacturers per se, but service and support is a concern, and this was only heightened by the fact that neither responded to my inquiries. Although to be fair, this may have had something to do with the COVID problems. So in the end, I chose the Elko EP40 motor and control system. One thing I wasn't too keen on, however, were the batteries suggested by Elko. They offered Victron AGM, that is lead acid, batteries to power the motor. Because the EP40 runs at 108 volts, I would need nine of these Victron 12 volt batteries arranged in series. Nine of these batteries at 12 volts and at 165 amp hours each would provide a theoretical capacity of 17.8 kilowatt hours. These batteries are also 135 pounds a piece, creating a combined weight of a hefty 1,215 pounds. Add the 400 pound Elko motor, and we end up with a system weight of 1,615 pounds. For comparison, the Volvo Penta engine and transmission that I took out, along with 100 gallons of diesel, which is the capacity of the boat, weighs about 950 pounds. So the proposed system with the Victron batteries would have weighed the boat down by an additional 665 pounds. That might not seem like much compared to the 28,000 pound weight of the boat, but when you add provisions, water, and people for a long passage, you push the boat deeper into the water and start affecting how the boat behaves underway, to the point that you can even affect safety. So adding that kind of weight should be avoided if possible. The other major drawback of lead acid batteries is the cycle life. According to Victron's own numbers, the deep cycle AGM battery only gets about 600 cycles at just a 50% depth of discharge. And a 50% max discharge is typically the recommended amount to avoid accelerated degradation of the battery. So what that means is that instead of the theoretical 17.8 kilowatt hours of power, we realistically only have about half of that, or just 9.8 kilowatt hours. And with a 29 kilowatt motor, we'd only have maybe half an hour of juice to move the boat at any kind of speed. 
So given the limitations of lead-acid batteries, I started looking around for a lithium-ion alternative. As I started searching, I had three main requirements. First, the output voltage obviously needed to be 108 volts to match the Elco motor. Two, the batteries needed to have a sufficient rate of discharge also to meet the demands of the motor. And three, the batteries needed to fit in the space I had available. The very first problem I encountered was that no lithium-ion battery manufacturer would let me string their batteries together in series sufficient to get up to 108 volts. The problem arises from having to balance charging across multiple cells. So I ended up seeking a custom battery solution from the lithium battery store. They were able to quote me two custom battery modules that met all my criteria, space, discharge rate, and voltage. They even worked directly with Alco to ensure that everything would work together. The proposal is for two 108 volt, 100 amp hour battery modules. This will give me a theoretical 21.6 kilowatt hours of capacity. And because lithium ion can be routinely discharged to 80%, I end up with 17.3 kilowatt hours of actual usable power. This is versus the 8.9 kilowatt hours of the lead acid option. In the life cycle of the lithium ion modules at 80% depth of discharge is 8,000 cycles compared to just 600 cycles for lead acid. And there's a big weight advantage too. A combined weight of 400 pounds for the lithium ion modules versus 1,215 pounds for lead acid. So instead of increasing the total system weight by 685 pounds, I'm actually decreasing it by 150. But let's go back to the pros and cons list for a second. What about the first con? The cost. Well, let's first look at the cost if I had decided to keep the Volvo Penta engine. I can't be sure how much it would have cost to get the engine running properly, but at a minimum, I know the fuel pump needed rebuilding or replacing, the turbocharger was seized, and the transmission had several leaks. I think that any kind of rebuild or repair would at easily cost $2,000. Add to that the ongoing fuel cost, with diesel at about $3 a gallon, a burn rate of 2 gallons per hour, and a typical recreational sailboat running for 100 hours per year adds up to $600 per year. So, over 10 years, that's a total cost excluding things like oil changes, wind arising, and some other maintenance, of about $8,000. Another option would be to drop in a new diesel engine and transmission. That, along with 10 years worth of fuel, would be about $19,500. Now, if I went with a new Elko motor and the cheaper lead-acid batteries, it would be about $19,000. And this amount is all in the purchase price because there's no meter at the dock for power since that cost is covered by the annual dock fee regardless of how much power I use. And finally, there's the cost of the Elko motor with the custom lithium ion batteries. Now, I'm going to adjust the diesel costs a bit because the 100 hour per year number for running the engine is an average and I plan to use my boat way more than average. So here, I just doubled the fuel cost. That brings the cost of the electric system more in line. So yes, going electric, especially with lithium ion, is more expensive. But when you weigh the pros and cons, I think it's definitely worth it. But I also want to explore the cost difference between lead acid and lithium ion in a bit more detail. The batteries, as envisioned from my boat, would be about $4,000 for the nine Victron batteries versus $12,000 for the two custom lithium-ion batteries. But as I mentioned before, the lithium-ion batteries have nearly double the usable power and more than 10 times the cycle life. So dividing the cost by the total lifetime power output gives us the cost per kilowatt hour. Here you can see that the lithium-ion is actually eight times less expensive. However, 8,000 cycles is more than I would ever use in a lifetime of sailing. So I calculated what the break-even point would be and it came out at about 930 cycles. That's certainly a number that I could easily hit in the next 10 to 15 years of sailing. So it makes sense to go with a lithium-ion alternative. 
Another consideration when repowering with electric is the weight distribution on the boat. The original diesel arrangement had a 250 pound engine below the main cabin and 700 pounds of diesel in the two tanks under the cockpit lazarettes. That put the center of mass about here at the blue circle. The new system with the 400 pound Elko motor and another 400 pounds of lithium ion batteries will be here with the motor exactly where the diesel was and the batteries also below the floorboards just aft of the motor. This puts the center of mass right about here, a bit lower and forward of the original. Now, let's suppose I repurpose the diesel fuel tanks to hold more water. This could come in very handy for long passages since I don't have a water maker. That adds several hundred pounds to the overall weight, but it does put the center of mass right back to the original location. The other major consideration is determining how to charge the house bank, which is kept completely separate from the batteries used to drive the motor. I've got four 6-volt golf cart batteries wired in series and parallel for a 12-volt system. Previously, these batteries would have been charged by the engine alternator anytime I was away from the dock. Just run the engine once or twice a day and keep your house bank full. Obviously, that's no longer an option. The solution again is sufficient wind and solar to keep up with the house demand as well as to repower the drive batteries in a reasonable period of time. So, I hope you found this video informative. What do you think? Am I doing the right thing going electric? Is lithium ion the right choice? If you have a boat, would you consider doing something similar? Leave me a comment below. I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. And I'll be back in a month or two when I have the new electric propulsion system installed. Thanks.